Hello everybody, it's Aaron here at the Battle of Preston Pans Museum in East Lothian with the 21st video update for the What If interactive war game campaign brought to you by the Battle of Preston Pans Heritage Trust. Welcome to all those new subscribers and as always thanks to all those who've been following us. This is getting pretty intense now as we move into the middle of May 1746. So just to remind us where our strategic situation was at the end of the last update, the Jacobite army having got back across the border and linked up with Tullibardin and brought fresh regiments into the force, has decided to take the battle back into England uh, and try and prevent the Duke of Cumberland, who's moving up from Newcastle, from linking up with Colonel Durand's forces, that sizeable body of militia and marines at Berwick-upon-Tweed. So we have the Jacobites there in blue marching down through Lauderdale and then crossing the Tweed near Coldstream uh, and heading across intending to cut the Great North Road. They, very short of cavalry, are unaware of the exact location of the Duke of Cumberland. So the plan was simply to get onto the Great North Road and then march southwards, pushing the Cumberland further away from Durand. And so we are left with the potential for an engagement in this vicinity here. So our Jacobites coming over the Tweed at Coldstream make as far as Ford. They camp at the castle there and then head on over the moorland and they head this way through Kylo to Fenwick. And that's where they are able to cross onto the Great North Road, from which they'll be able to head south towards Newcastle and encounter Cumberland wherever he may be, hopefully catching him on the march. One thing they do have to be aware of is that, of course, the road goes both ways here and there is the potential, especially since Cumberland can communicate with Berwick by sea, uh, for uh, reinforcements, Duran's men, to come down to support Cumberland from the rear. The further the Jacobites can get away from Berwick, the less likely it is uh, that that will be able to be affected. Now, the march across has brought the Jacobites over the moorland and past some areas of pretty dense woodland and rocky outcrops and high hills. Uh, but they're coming down towards the Great North Road, the line of the A1 today, of course, in Northumberland, uh, where the landscape is more open, more gentle uh, and perhaps more conducive to a major engagement. The Jacobites make good progress on the morning of the 16th of May 1746 and by early afternoon their vanguard units are moving down towards Kylo onto the coastal landscape around the village of Fenwick. So let's have a closer look at this particular landscape. We've got the Great North Road coming into Fenwick itself and then doglegging out past some woodland heading south towards Newcastle. Uh, the uh, current A1 uh, that runs through here these days. Uh, just off the main road, there's a farm at Kylo with the ruins of a tower and house next to it. So that is still there. Uh, there's a small settlement at Kylo, uh, West Kylo, uh, with a small chapel there too. There's some pretty rugged, almost impassable uh, hills and woods over uh, on the side there. Uh, and uh, just uh, creeping into the edge of the map is the shoreline, the sandy shoreline that faces towards uh, Lindisfarne. Our Jacobites uh, will be coming into this landscape from the direction of Loic, which will bring them in along the road here. And from there, they'll be able to march south in search of Cumberland. Picking those features out on my tabletop there, uh, starting at the top left, there's the, the chapel at West Kylo, uh, the sandy shore to the right of it, uh, looking uh, inland. Then we've got the village of Fenwick itself with the Great North Road doglegging through it. Uh, down at the bottom in the centre, the ruined tower house at uh, Kylo Farm uh, and those rugged, impractical hills uh, looking down over the battlefield. Turning the map onto its side then, as we've done plenty of times before, uh, we now have the Jacobites coming in from this side uh, onto the Great North Road and heading off towards Cumberland that way. And much to their surprise, as the Jacobites come down in column of march onto this landscape, uh, they find themselves facing towards the pickets of Hawley's Cavalry Division. 
Uh, and so they have stumbled down onto the Great North Road at almost exactly the same time as Cumberland's uh, advance guards have reached the same point. Uh, this took some fine calculation in terms of the distances that the two armies would have marched, assuming they'd set off at roughly the same time, and assuming, of course, that the Jacobites had no real intelligence uh, as to exactly uh, where Cumberland might be. So the Jacobites have got onto the field first, but they are in march column. All their artillery is stacked to the rear, uh, and they have very little cavalry uh, out in front to, uh, to help blunten the force uh, of any sudden shock uh, at the vanguard. But Cumberland's army is in march column following behind and has not yet arrived on the battlefield, leaving Hawley to hold the position independently for the moment. So here we see our Jacobite vanguard uh, deploying into line. This is, these are men from uh, Murray's division uh, on the Great North Road itself. On the trackway leading down from the moorland uh, and past uh, Kylo uh, Farm and Chapel, uh, there we have the Jacobite centre coming down in column in that little bottleneck. And behind, coming uh, down off the hill still in column, uh, we have... Uh, Drummonds, uh, French and English regiments, and then behind them, Tullibardins escorting the Jacobite artillery train. Cumberland's vanguard uh, is Hawley's cavalry, as I've mentioned, but behind it come the first of the Hessian regiments in column, uh, and they are marching up in Hawley's wake, and they arrive on the battlefield uh, for the purposes of uh, this encounter. Uh, Cumberland's regiments will be fed onto uh, the battle each successive turn automatically in their divisions. As the Hessians move on to the field and fix the Jacobite attention on the road itself, Hawley swings his force to the right round the side of uh, Fenwick village uh, as if to make use of the open space on the coastal side of the battlefield uh, to threaten uh, the Jacobite left. So our Jacobite force, as it's moving onto the field, is able to spend a bit of time moving out of column into line. And as you can see here, uh, sorting that flank out so that the vanguard is able to incline to face off Hawley's threat to the Jacobite left. And after a few delays and a bit of management, uh, the Jacobite right is able to get up into line on the high ground overlooking Kylo Farm. And indeed, they're able to get some of their guns up there and unlimbered and the first long-range shots are fired at the deploying Hessians beyond. And who would have believed it, but the Hessians, uh, having first come under fire, are now turning about and are withdrawing from the field. They're making a rapid retreat back down the Great North Road to advise Cumberland that this is not a position in which they should feel comfortable engaging the enemy. They now know where the Jacobites are, uh, and they'd be better pulling back to form a defensive line further along the road. This is extraordinary. It was, in fact, a blunder roll uh, by, in the order's turn for the Hessians, and since they're the only infantry that have deployed, uh, the uh, only decision plausible was for Henry Hawley to cover the retreat and for the Jacobites to be left in possession of the field. Now, we had calculated that this engagement would have taken place uh, in the mid to late afternoon on the 16th of May, uh, and we had made it a uh, turn limited engagement to represent the fact that there was only a part of the day left in which to fight. So it was determined that at the end of already quite a long march across from Ford, the Jacobites were unlikely to be able to advance uh, and uh, pursue uh, Cumberland's vanguard back, especially as Hawley was withdrawing in good order to cover them. So we've settled our Jacobite army uh, around uh, Fennec village uh, and it will move off again in the morning. During the course of the night, Unbeknown to the Jacobites, as it turns out, uh, Colonel Durand had arrived with reinforcements for Cumberland's army from the Berwick garrison. Uh, they had been signalled uh, by sea that they should be bringing down uh, troops in support and that there was likely to be general action. Had the battle taken place, then Durand would have been coming up into the rear of the Jacobite army during the battle uh, if he'd got there in time. As it is, uh, he's got there seen the enemy encamped across the Great North Road and has made a pretty smart withdrawal back to Berwick uh, before the Jacobites are able to turn upon him. So the Battle of Fenwick, as it turns out, is a great disappointment, something of an anticlimax, especially for the person who'd done the research and built the table. 
However, the Jacobites have achieved their objective in the short term. They have got between Durand and Cumberland. Cumberland will not be able now uh, to expect Durand to help him in a coming engagement uh, because he's moved south and the Jacobites are able to push beyond a day's march for the Berwick garrison. On the morning then of the 17th of May, the Jacobites move out of their uh, improvised encampment around Fenwick village and move uh, just about three miles to the south towards Cumberland's position at Belford. So I'm obliged to start again and describe for you a new landscape. We have our Great North Road running down the middle, north to south into Belford village. Uh, to the east of the village is the estate uh, of Belford Hall. Uh, there is some high ground off to the western side there. Uh, what's marked there as ruins appears to be uh, a little hill fort. Uh, there is a small burn running along the top edge of our map here and um, the estate grounds at Middleton. Uh, the uh, uh, very large fancy house that's at Middleton now was not yet there. Uh, likewise, uh, Belford Hall is there, but it is not the fine Palladium mansion that would be built in a decade or so. Uh, so this is our landscape and the Duke of Cumberland uh, is in this landscape already on the morning of the 17th of May, waiting for his enemy. Just to familiarise yourself, picking up those features on the battlefield itself, uh, starting at the top, there is the small walled estate at Middleton uh, beside the brook. Uh, then working our way round, we have the walled estate of uh, Belford Hall. Uh, there is Belford Village itself, a uh, small church, not the uh, fine towered church that's there today, uh, and uh, the high ground over off to the west. And once again, turning it in onto its side for us so that we can orientate uh, in the same way as our table. And here we have it. It's a much more open landscape than our previous uh, uh, terrain. Uh, you can see the line of the burn running along the uh, right hand edge, the Great North Road running through the centre uh, into Belford Village and the walled estate uh, of Belford Hall here. High ground uh, creeping in here. Uh, with the uh, the uh, summit of the hill fort uh, being uh, the key one there, and the small park around Middleton here. Now the sun comes up for us and reveals Cumberland's army in position, the combination of Cumberland's forces and Hess Castle's forces. Uh, so you can see in the foreground uh, one of the Hessian regiments there uh, backed up with a second behind it and then uh, a mix of British regulars and militia um, and uh, supported by mortars. Uh, this right hand flank of Cumberland's army looking pretty solid. Looking from the rooftops of the village itself into part of Cumberland Centre, what you can see is that he's deployed the Hessians into his front line with the British regiments in the second line, supported by mortars and artillery. Uh, you could argue that he's paying the Hessians handsomely for their presence, so he might as well make good use of them. He has very few regular British regiments uh, left after a succession of engagements over the past year. Uh, and so he's uh, he's making sure that they're not exposed to the brunt uh, of any enemy attack. And over towards the high ground on Cumberland's left, the western side of the battlefield, there we have Henry Hawley with his very formidable uh, cavalry brigade, Hessian Hussars to the fore, and then the horse grenadiers, the horse guards, uh, and uh, a much reduced battle-weary group uh, of the Blues. After an advance of about three miles, the Jacobites have moved into this landscape and deployed into line. The Jacobite left is Drummond's division. Uh, the two remaining uh, French regiments available to the Jacobite forces, Ruth's there at the fore and Dillon's behind. And then the two English Jacobite regiments, Townley's uh, at the front line there. And behind them, the uh, Northumberland regiment on home territory, who've spent most of this conflict in garrison at Newcastle. Next to Drummond's division is Lord George Murray's, the Duke of Perth's regiment in the front line, backed by uh, the Athol Brigade, one battalion, uh, and behind them, uh, the small squadron of the Strathallan Horse, who've been with the Prince right since the beginning of the campaign. 
Then we have the Duke of Perth's division with the John Roy Stewart's Edinburgh Regiment at the front, behind them Cromarty's, uh, and then further along uh, a composite unit predominantly made up of Clan Donald men, uh, survivors from other battered Highland regiments uh, that have taken casualties during the conflict. Behind them, the Lowlanders uh, of Ogilvy's regiment. Further along, we have more Highlanders under Tolibardin, including the Frasers and the Clan and over at the extreme Jacobite right, you can see Tully Bardin here just deploying a battery uh, and some of his men uh, into the grounds at Middleton. Now the Jacobites know that the stakes are extremely high in this battle. They also know that this war cannot go on forever. There needs to be an outcome. And so they are determined uh, to fight. They have got Cumberland in the field without Durand being able to support him. So even though they are outgunned and outnumbered and outhorsed, this is the best chance they're likely to have of inflicting a defeat. So in they go. The whole Jacobite army begins to advance under the cloak of smoke provided by its opening artillery salvo. Return fire by the British artillery proves more effective, however, and it does slow the advance of Murray's division. Uh, and as the Jacobites move forwards, the prince decides to shog the entire line uh, towards the right to move his forces away uh, from Belford Hall. The prince has no intention of wasting men attacking uh, those uh, men on Cumberland's right who are behind stone walls. The Jacobite right advances more quickly, moving up onto higher ground, occupying Chester's Hill where the hill fort stands uh, and moving towards Hawley's as they uh, push obliquely towards the right. It's critical that Tully Bardin's men are able to, if not defeat Hawley, but pin the cavalry on that flank. They cannot afford to allow all of that massed British cavalry to get behind the Jacobite flank when it launches its attack. So the first real action of the battle is a charge of the Fraser's regiment into the Hessian Hussars who countercharge back in and a furious melee ensues on the Jacobite right. Alongside the Fraser's, in go the Clan Hatton attacking the Horse Grenadier Guards. The battle here ebbs and flows. It's impossible, it seems, to tell who's going to gain the advantage. Although Frasers of Lovitz are driven back by the Hussars initially, a volley from the Lowlanders from the border regions behind drives the Hussars back behind the Blues. Then the horse grenadiers are driven back in their turn, and it seems the Jacobites are starting to gain the advantage. Perhaps even more importantly, uh, disorder starts to set in amongst the horse guards, uh, and they are prevented from being able to charge at the critical moment. Meanwhile, to Tully Bardin's left, the Jacobite charge has gone crashing in towards Cumberland's front line. But just as everything seems to be going well in the Jacobite attack, there's a blunder. Lord George Murray's division seems to misunderstand how far to the right it's supposed to oblique. Instead of advancing this way in support of John Roy Stuart's and the Duke of Perth's regiments as they charge, Murray's regiments end up coming to their right onto Chester's Hill. And so we have one big, well-supported attack going in right on Cumberland's left of centre, and a much weaker Jacobite attack going in along the rest of the line. Is this going to be a critical blunder that weakens the power of the Jacobite assault? As the Jacobites attack, they run through a hail of platoon fire, they run through canister fire, and now they're being shelled by the British mortars uh, who have two positions along the length of Cumberland's line uh, in order to break up the momentum of the charge. Now, whilst the Herb Prince regiment on the left here is able to just about hold on against the Clan Donald men that have smashed into it, Murray has finally been able to launch his men forwards uh, and they have actually broken through uh, the British line at the centre here. Uh, they haven't, however, succeeded in routing their opponents. They've only rolled them back to the fringes of Belford village. Uh, and from there, the second line uh, is able to provide uh, damaging fire uh, into the charging clansmen. Nevertheless, this is a dangerous moment. The Duke of Cumberland himself here in the centre is almost caught out by the charging clansmen uh, as he's trying to get across to help uh, Hess Castle regain control of the situation. The British line has buckled, it's bent, it hasn't yet broken. 
Further along the line, the Duke of Perth's regiment have charged in against uh, the Hessian grenadiers, but Murray's regiment, which has charged off to their right, should have been in here in support of them. The only unit that's been able to come up in support of Perth's is that small squadron of Strathallans. You can see to their rear the French and English regiments that have been shogging to the right, moving uh, to provide some weight, but there's still some distance off. The Duke of Perth regiment here is pretty much fighting it out alone. The result, I'm sorry to say, is a disaster. Perth's regiment are utterly routed, and with them the Strathallans too, who are unable uh, to withstand the volleys uh, of those Hessian grenadiers. More bad news for the Jacobites. The gap in the middle of this picture is where John Roy Stewart's Edinburgh Regiment should be. But after their success in driving back the Hessian front line, they were stopped by the foot guards in the second line behind. Now, Murray's in the foreground here have successfully pushed through themselves, but they shouldn't be here. They should have been in the supporting positions, helping protect uh, John Roy's and the Duke of Perth's regiments as they engaged. Meanwhile, the Clandonald men with uh, Ogilvy's behind them uh, have managed to break and rout uh, the Herb Prince regiment, driving them off the field. And they come face to face with the Black Watch. Uh, the Black Watch haven't played a big part in this campaign so far, but now uh, they put a volley in uh, and they are able to stop uh, the charge of the Clandonald. But they are not able to break them. But now that their momentum has stalled, uh, the clansmen here on the right of the Jacobite infantry line are stopped by volley fire from the Black Watch. They are stopped by close quarters canister fire from the British and Hessian artillery. Uh, and uh, they can see the holes opening up in the Jacobite line further along. There are now British regiments that are not engaged and are able to start manoeuvring to put their fire into the flank of those Jacobite regiments that have succeeded in pushing home their charge, wheeling into positions where their cannon can pour flanking fire into the advancing Jacobites. Sensing his moment, the Duke of Cumberland orders a husk over on his far right to move his men out of the walled estate and to start sweeping round, uh, threatening the Jacobite left. So to take an overview of the situation at the moment, the Jacobite charge up here has failed. The Jacobite charge here has failed. The Jacobite charge in the centre initially successful but has been driven back and only on the right of their infantry line has the Jacobite charge uh, been successful enough uh, to hold its ground after breaking through the front line. But with canister shot ripping into them and with the Black Watch showing no signs of breaking, uh, this is looking pretty tentative here. Further to the Jacobite right, the Frasers are now locked in a battle with the Horse Guards uh, and uh, although uh, the Lowland soldiers have been driven back uh, by the horse grenadiers and the Hessian hussars. They have made it to the safety of Middleton. There is a risk then of the Jacobite uh, army being cut off by the cavalry on its right. I should also highlight the French and English Jacobite regiments on the left are still intact uh, and they are here to deter that attempted flanking move by uh, Cumberland's forces out of Belford Hall Park. Sensing that this battle cannot here be won, the Jacobite army begins to try and disengage and retreat. Over on the right there, you see Cumberland is now moving forwards uh, to threaten the Jacobites on their left. The battle still rages on the Jacobite right, uh, but they are now pulling back their clan units from the successful engagement at the centre. Everything now depends on whether the Jacobites can successfully disengage enough of their men to keep this campaign alive, to keep their cause alive. Just to go in on a little bit more detail on the engagement between Tullibardin and Hawley's men over on the crucial Jacobite right, uh, it had gone back in a full circle. Uh, the horse guards have been charged now by the Frasers over on the left of the picture, uh, whilst the Hussars uh, are locked in with the Clan Hatton. They will very soon after this image is taken break through uh, the Clan Hatton, uh, but the Lowlanders behind them, as I've said, uh, will escape back to Middleton Park. 
In doing so, they've in fact unmasked the battery at Middleton Park, which is now able to play on the horse. It had been positioned there specifically for this reason, to protect the Jacobite flank uh, from any attempt to get round it. And uh, sure enough, some very impressive shooting from the Jacobite artillery rains down on those Hessians. And in fact, several rounds of battling have uh, weakened those Hessians sufficiently uh, that they are routed uh, by the artillery fire. Hawley therefore spends a little time consolidating the cavalry position. He does not wish uh, to charge down onto the Frasers who are disengaging uh, because if he does so, uh, he risks the traversing fire from that artillery battery and indeed uh, from the lowland muskets there too. Seeing that the horses aren't pursuing them, some of the Jacobite clansmen seem to be showing their disdain to the enemy. But there is no disguising the fact that this has been a defeat. The Jacobite army is withdrawing as best it can. It is under fire. At this point, critically, uh, there are some poor order rolls from the British and Hessian forces, which actually mean they move forwards pretty slowly and the Jacobites are able to gain a little bit of ground. So as we see, the prince's uh, centre is able to withdraw uh, and they're withdrawing back over the burn uh, up the Great North Road, uh, covered on their left uh, by the French and English regiments who've barely fired a shot, although they've been under pretty uh, heavy artillery fire throughout so far. They have left one artillery piece, you can see it up there on its lonesome, uh, covering uh, that withdrawal uh, from the forces moving out of Belford Park. Heartbroken though he is, the prince cannot afford to waste lives if he is to keep the cause alive. He tries his hardest to ensure that his men retreat in good order, uh, and uh, the order rolls on this occasion are in his favour. The Jacobites uh, are able to put distance between them and their enemy. And of course, we have to give a shout out to the Jacobite gunners, uh, who, whilst saving some of their uh, pieces, uh, also sacrificed themselves uh, by trying to keep the Hessians at bay on the extreme Jacobite left. Husk has no wish to waste the lives of his men by advancing forwards, uh, and so he brings his mortars to bear. And sure enough, the Jacobite gun on the left is silenced. On the other side of the field, the small Jacobite battalion and the battery at Middleton continue to provide covering fire for the other Jacobite regiments as they retreat, and Cumberland brings up his mortars and artillery. It takes long enough for the artillery to be brought up for all of the Jacobite forces now to be off the field, apart from that small picket at Middleton, and rather than be shelled into oblivion since their job is already done, at the end of the day, that garrison surrenders. They are putting themselves now at the mercy of the Duke of Cumberland. The Jacobite army uh, limps off the field. It goes back up the road to Fenwick and then cuts across to Lowick, where it finally stops exhausted. And from there, the following morning, it moves back through Ford and to the River Tweed at Coldstream. Although the English Jacobite regiments have emerged from the battle pretty much intact, this is home territory for a lot of these recruits and the prospect of moving back into Scotland on a road that is surely only going to take them further and further from home now proves too much. Desertion amongst these regiments is high in the first 24 hours after the battle. To save face, perhaps, the prince asks them to stay at Coldstream to defend the fords over the Tweed, whilst the rest of the army moves back towards Edinburgh. It's a face-saving exercise, and sure enough, these regiments uh, officially disband themselves once the prince has left the following morning. From Coldstream, the Jacobite army, or what's left of it, limps back onto Dalkeith and then to Edinburgh, where it still, of course, has a small garrison in the castle. Cumberland decides not to risk pursuing into difficult terrain. Rather, uh, he sends Hawley up to Berwick to link up with Durand. Uh, Hawley and Durand get a head start on Cumberland then and head off to Dunbar, Cumberland following in their wake, and soon uh, at uh, Haddington, all of the British forces will be reunited to threaten Edinburgh. 
The prince has lost more men along his march. He's marched through the borders region in which one of his regiments was recruited, uh, and many of those men have slipped away, further reducing his strength. At Holyrood, then, the prince has to decide whether he's going to hold the city and attempt a stand at Edinburgh, or whether the retreat will have to continue to Stirling or beyond. Cumberland has no depths of reserve. Could he inflict enough casualties on Cumberland at Edinburgh to force at least decent terms? It's unclear, and that will be up to our Council of War to decide. But what is clear is that it's highly unlikely that the Jacobite cause can recover from this final blow. As ever, thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.